before we start today I had a viewer contact me and I want to share this with you because it means so much to me um, this story and I know a lot of you can relate and uh, anyway let me just share it with you um, this person's name is Kathy Hudson and she says to me um, just here to say that my dad was an avid watcher since 2014 and he passed away last year May 23rd 2021 she says as I went through his belongings I found notebook after notebook full of notes and diagrams and takeaways from your videos and I want to thank you for your videos and knowledge you share on your channel you kept my father company and kept him learning in probably some of the darkest days while homeless and transitioning to low-income housing things I didn't know I wish I knew more about this you kept him eager to learn more than he already knew and my dad was always excited to share what he learned from you while he may have just been one subscribed viewer you were something he looked forward to and you will never know how much that means to me thank you again and so I asked her about um, who her father was because I wanted to know his name and she replied and told me a little bit more about her father her father's name was Rafael Venezuela as I said and he was a he was a premium member too and I knew his name because we talked so much over the years and um, she is carrying on his legacy she started using his tools and working on cars and I told her I'm gonna give her access to my my premium channel for as long as she wants it we're gonna set that up under her father's name uh, for his legacy to remember his legacy and that was one year uh, um, as of yesterday one year to the day um, and she's celebrating his life and I just just wanted to share that with you guys because I feel like um, so many of you I I get to interact with and and get to be part of your lives and and on occasion I get to witness that and it's unfortunate it was through death but death isn't the end and we know that and and I just um, I'm just grateful to be in this position and I don't always um, convey my beliefs you know it's kind of not really <laughs> what to do when you're fixing cars um, and sometimes you know when I smash my hand with with a hammer or do something and cut myself you know I drop you know a lot of cuss words and I'm a mechanic so you got to forgive me for that and you know that's not really uh, being salt and light but um, we just want to do that whenever possible to give glory uh, to our God our Creator um, who has sustained all of us who gives us the air today to breathe and so we're grateful and thankful for that and and we um, you know we we believe that there's more to come and again that death isn't the end and we're grateful Kathy for your father and um, one day we'll see Raphael again and uh, so if you guys stuck around this long <laughs> let's go fix this van 2015 Chevy Express this thing's got 183,000 miles on it that's a lot of miles it's a work van from what my brother told me uh, it came in with some lean exhaust codes and it was not acting up it had an O2 code lean exhaust codes and we've seen these before in the Chevy Express vans where an oxygen sensor failure on one bank can create misfires on that entire bank. In fact, I'll put a link to a video I did on one of these, it was exactly that. O2 was reporting uh, a false rich condition and the computer pulled all the fuel away on one bank and had misfires on every cylinder on that bank. There was actually one that we did at Rosedale Technical College and that van had all new coils put in it for that problem and I believe injectors on that side too and uh, didn't fix it, it was just a bad O2. So because it wasn't acting up, my brother told the owner, well, we can throw a new O2 at it and you know, take your chances, 183,000 miles. It was, a, it was a good you know first step or good guess, if you wanna call it, uh, that didn't fix it. So it came back now setting uh, additional codes and he, he found codes for the fuel injectors and him and I looked at a wiring diagram and um, it does have two fuses for each bank one for each bank and those fuses um, support current flow to the ignition coils and fuel injectors on each bank so 
Um, we're concerned about maybe losing power to the injectors. And then there's a question why we didn't have coil faults because we didn't only injector faults. And that just may be in the logics of the circuit. So we might be dealing with a main power feed issue to one bank, like a connector problem, um, or maybe some driver issues in the computer, but it's on one bank. So anyway, that's where we are. That's all I know going into this, talking with my brother, looking at a diagram the other day about what he was seeing. Uh, so here's my code scan. All right, so let's do our code display, see what we have. So he's got no codes in here right now. That's kind of poopy it's okay so we really need to uh, make this happen let me try something here don't know if I can get mode 10 data which would give me the history of this let me let me see if I can so mode 10 is is something that will store faults permanently and they added that uh, in the later years display permanent trouble code so I what I did is I exited out manufacturer specific and I went in uh, under global OBD2, that's where I'm getting that. So that's pretty cool. There's my injector codes. Injector circuit open, one, three, five, and seven. Um, and that was mode 10 data for you guys that um, are curious of how I did that. Uh, it is only available in global mode and global data, not manufacturer specific. Notice it says no active vehicle at the bottom. And so you can look up history of codes. And I would imagine there'd be more than that there. So I don't want to get lost in mode 10 data. That's where I got it. We need to recreate that. Driving it may not be the best approach here. Let me just start it, see if we... not misfiring at the moment I'm trying to think what data would be most useful for us I don't know that misfire data will if we're getting injector codes on the entire bank we're gonna have misfires I'm I'm interested in some data that maybe is gonna share that voltage on that circuit for me if maybe we have ignition coil type stuff you know honestly a bulletin search wouldn't be a bad place to start too there may be a common problem for this. If it was doing it all the time, no problem. The fact that it's intermittent is gonna make this a little bit challenging. Okay, we can look at these. These injector control circuit, low and high voltage status. Yeah, we'll just kind of keep that on the screen. Let's go for a ride. Let's do a couple of brake tours. This guy must be pretty tall because I need to move the seat forward. Do a reverse brake torque. Drive. I hate to get this thing like super hot. What choice do we have, right? I feel like we're gonna have to have this dog house off too. You know how those go. This alternator singing. That battery voltage. That battery voltage was low though when we started. It was like 11.8 on the scan tool. So it's just trying to charge this battery up. So driving this really, mm, I'm not sure that that's this is the right approach because I don't have anything with me. If if it starts to misfire. I didn't bring any test leads with me um, or a diagram or a place to start doing my checks, which is which fuse is it that controls them. Um, I really should have a test lead right now on one of the fuel injectors on bank one, which is going to be it's going to be this side. Those codes were key to know, right? Did I say one, three, five, and seven, Caleb, when I when I read the injectors? Pretty sure I did. So having that mode 10 uh, fault code storage was was actually super helpful for me on, on where to connect a test lead. Had I not had that information, I wouldn't know which bank of injectors was setting the code. I mean, I could talk with my brother and maybe he has that information. We're gonna prepare ourselves a little bit more here for what we're doing. So next step, let's go into the hood and then uh, I can't unbuckle my seatbelt. 
we'll go into the hood and I'll, I'll look at, I'm <laughs> laboring in what I'm doing first. Let's go into the hood. I'll do a couple visual inspections and then we'll probably get some type of test lead connected up to one of the fuel injectors on bank one side and then we'll go drive it again. Let's pull a diagram. I don't know if I have, if I'm close enough to Danner's Wi-Fi here. Injector even, injector odd. That's gonna be us right here, these guys. And that is fuse what? Fuse number 65, it's a 20 amp fuse. Okay, so is it, okay, ignition coil one, three, five, and seven. So I'm just thinking we can see the ignition coils right here. And I'm thinking I go after one of the power wires on the coil rather than the injector because I can't see the injector. And I, I don't really want to take that doghouse off. So that's what I'm thinking is, is maybe what we're going to do, adapt to one of the coils. Um, it's certainly worth a visual inspection, um, but I still want to connect to a coil. All right, I was able to access the injector wires, just pulled the tape away using my Phil's probe. Here, man, let's get a shot of Phil's. Oh, technician of the year, electrical probe, All right? This guy's a technician, made this thing. Best back probing or piercing tool on the market. We're gonna go after this guy right here, pink wire. Okay, and we'll get direct voltage measurements right here on the end of this. It has a piece that accepts a uh, banana jack style test lead. It goes right on there, and now I'm directly connected to that number one fuel injector. Should have 12 volts on this circuit right now. 11.7, this battery's dying. Yep, 11.7, all right, good. All right, now we can look at our harness and we'll do some wiggle inspections while we're looking at that. 11.7, battery's getting weak. Uh, I'm gonna start it just because of that. Got some significant, well, those are just injector firings with peak detect turned on. I was gonna say significant voltage drops, but maybe not. 20 milliseconds. <laughs> All right, let's go wiggle that fuse box. I think that's what I want to start with because of the harness in here looks good. Go one second and then we'll turn peak detect on for that. That might be a little bit misleading to some. Okay. I don't remember what fuse number it was. Uh, see if GM was nice to me. Looking for injector fuse. Ignition injector, that's 65 for that one. There should be two. 65 is my odd ones. That should be my guy then. 79 is the other one. Okay, even, it says it right there. Even uh, injector, or ignition and injector for 79 and 65 is odd. I thought it said overdrive. <laughs> odd, and so 65 is my guy, 65 is down here and 79 is down, so the last two, 65 and 79. The fuse 65 has been replaced, look at it. The question is, is why? So that's the guy, 65 is the one that is my, my odds and that's my evens. Interesting. Let's go back here and let's wiggle that fuse. Just kind of pushing on it a little bit with my, my tool. Wiggle on that fuse. No changes. Intermittents are the worst, guys. Now what? I guess we go drive it while we're watching this voltage. Is that directed at me? Yep. Now I have peak detect turned on on this, which is like a huge sample rate. And that's why you see a lot of noise in here. The spikes that you're seeing would be, an in, would be injector and coil firings. So when injectors fire and coils fire, you're gonna have drops in voltage and you're gonna have spikes. And with peak detect turned on, that's what you're looking at there. 
That drop was not normal though. There was one I just saw there that was absolutely not normal. I should have froze it and looked at the buffer there for a second. We'll wait till I see another one, then I'll point it out to you guys. Of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> fuel light's on. Lesson to the customers out there. You take your car that has an intermittent drivability problem to a technician, and he's got to drive it to make it do it, please put gas in the car. I saw a momentary dropout when we first started, and, and now it's not there anymore. What was I doing? I was turning the car. Let's recreate that. I had the parking brake on. Parking brake was on, it was yelling at me. And then I released it. I turned around. It was like right when I did that, I saw a drop. I need to look at this harness inside again. It wasn't like enough to set injector codes. Are you thinking it could be like wires touching or something? Or opening. Like if wire's touching metal, then it's gonna short to ground and blow a fuse. That fuse was replaced. What about and, if it's just a complete open? Well, what it could be now though, is it could be that it has shorted to ground in the past. It's not shorting to ground right now, but that wire is now corroded and we're getting voltage drops on that circuit and temperature may affect that. I should have stopped and looked at the buffer before because I, I had a lower voltage number. It was just real momentary. I'm gonna look at that harness underneath here. Under there. You can just stay there. You're not gonna be able to see anything anyway. What to do? How to proceed? You know, once you get involved, the hard part for all of us on jobs like this is, you know, we've, we already have half an hour in this. You know, some of it we're, what's that? So it's gonna be four hours. Well, yeah, I mean, that wasn't my point though. My point is, as a garage owner, as a technician, you've got a half an hour in this car already, just in research and pulling a diagram and looking at common denominators and looking at harnesses, visual inspections, and you're committed. This is one of the jobs where you need to finish, like finish your diagnosis. And generally what we do is, like I told you guys, five minutes, 60 minutes, doesn't matter. We're 30 minutes in this, we're not finding anything. We need to keep checking this circuit for at least another half an hour. And this would involve, and part of that can include going to the gas station, putting some gas in it. Um, part of your road test. And then at the end of that hour, if we don't find anything, you stop. The customer's getting charged. This isn't free. We don't work for free. We have an idea of where our problem is, but you ask the customer how much more time they want to spend. Um, if it takes two more hours to locate this intermittent fault, we need the okay from our customer to continue to investigate. We don't work for free. So just uh, advising you guys on how to make money doing this. You charge your initial, initial diagnostic fee. We tell the customer what we found, what it's not, right? What it's not meaning like this doesn't need a tune-up. It doesn't need plugs and wires. It doesn't need ignition coils. We have fuel injector fault codes on one bank that is causing his condition. So inform your customer where you are inform him where you want to go. It might even be Mr. or Mrs. Customer, take the car, bring it back when it happens again, and then we'll continue from there. Communication's key. Um, if I am doing mobile diagnostics and I'm at a garage, my approach to this problem right now is exactly that. I'm gonna give it another half an hour doing my thing and I'll write up a list of what I found and then advise how to go from there charge my diagnostic fee for traveling to that garage and doing my job and then taking that fee and running, right?
you'll uh, maybe get a call back next visit and it's not free next time you show up so I'm, I'm just tired of this working for free idea and that if you don't find anything you can't charge bullshit bull crap <laughs> all right i'll do some more wiggle testing under the hood that's my that's my plan that's my approach right now all right so my plan right now is to pull this fuse and then see if this will set ignition coil codes too so that's coils and injectors sweet okay only injector codes no coil code so why is it not setting ignition coil codes is not really my concern we got engine misfires occurring now too let me plug this fuse back in the reason i did that is is one of the questions you guys might have is if in fact it is a power feed problem on that circuit why is it not setting ignition coil codes and my answer to you is i don't care anymore does that make sense i pulled the fuse what do we see it, immediate injector codes. Now I do have a P0300 random misfire, but I have no ignition coil code. So that just means the logics for the ignition coil circuits are different than they are for the fuel injectors. So I don't care. What I do care is I believe I'm on the right track in chasing the power feed side of this circuit for these codes um, in that test. That's what that proved to me. I hated pulling that fuse. Yeah, you unplug a fuse, plug it back in. What if that fuse connection was my only problem and now it, it's never gonna do it to us? But I had to prove that point. Let's get a digital number up there too, an average. 13.5. Ah, oh, damn, I don't know what to do with this. I really feel like maybe we just go drive it again and go get some gas and cross our fingers that we can watch this do it. Maybe maybe pull a diagram and look at where these connectors go from the fuse box. Let's see if we can do that. So we have the G connector underneath, the J connectors for the other side. So G1, G2, G3. And then I'm just looking at the harness to see. Just looking at this harness to see what other connectors are potentially in here for this pink circuit. There's a splice, so then there's another one. Okay, so the X126 connector, but that's for the coils. That's, see it says H and F and C and B. The X126 connector, it's a hyperlink. I could click that, but that's my coils. I'm not worried about the coils. I'm worried about the fuel injectors. Let's see if we have, we don't. There's no specific connector for those ignition or injector circuits that go straight from the fuse box. All of those wires go right to that G connector that's underneath the fuse box. And that's where, really where I need to look. That battery voltage is dropping pretty quickly too. I have to be careful what I'm doing, this is live. I don't want the hot leads to touch anything. All right, can I wiggle this? under here I'm just moving wires under the harness. Yeah, I'm trying to trying to find the the connector too. Like which one I'm dealing with here. Just got not getting any drops whatsoever. It could be heat related too. I want to know why that fuse was changed. It's maybe someone changed it just because they thought maybe a, you know, they had corrosion on a fuse in the past. Like I, I need to, let's go talk to Danner and see what we can find out about why this fuse was changed. So Danner's not here. He had to go to the eye doctor. Our hands are tied. I think maybe, maybe Caleb and I will drive it and 
put gas in it so we can continue, you know? I don't know. I don't know what to do. You know, our problem is it's looking like potentially fuse box related. I don't see any other reason for this code to be setting. And I'm not seeing any obvious damage. Yeah, I think that's gonna be the plan. I think, let me just look a little bit more. Turn the key back on. Let me look at this diagram again. I don't think it's gonna be any type of relay issue because if it was this engine controls ignition relay, we'd be, we'd have O2 sensor codes. Although Danner did mention having an O2 fault, um, it would shut this engine off. Look, ECM powertrain, fuse 78. We'd have, uh, looks like mass airflow, canister vent. We would have codes for those. Yeah, I'm not thinking it's gonna be an engine control ignition relay issue because then we'd have, we'd have, um, faults for the other injectors too and the engine would be shutting down on him and he's not complaining of that he's complaining about a, a misfire an intermittent misfire low power so no i don't think so what do you do man what do you do we're like at the end of our initial hour diagnostic time how do you handle this as a technician you don't want to stop because customers don't like to pay they don't like to pay unless you tell them what's wrong. Well, you know what? We need to tell them what's not wrong. And then we charge them. And then we have them come back. Um, we're gonna do our best to recreate this fault. And uh, we live to fight another day, is that the phrase? Yeah. Um, at this point, I put the fuse box back on. Um, Caleb and I were just gonna go get some gas and we're gonna get some food while we're test driving this car. What was your question, Caleb? I was gonna say you're trying to maybe condemn the fuse box. Yes. And I'm not, like, I don't get to fully pay attention, yeah. basically. But how much wiring is there to check before and after the fuse box for you to be able to, like, isolate it to that? Because like, you're chasing harnesses there's a good and bit. all that. Well, yeah, there's a good bit, but, um, the, the issue is like, if you look at the diagram, all of those wires for one, three, um, one, three, five, and seven, they all individually go to that fuse box. Yeah. So we can't really have one wire coming out further downstream that's causing this because all of those- it's happening on all of them. Yes. That's what I was missing. I didn't-, I didn't So you're right, that's a great question. If there was a split, let me pull the diagram back up just to be sure. Well, you're not gonna have like, a all of those wires messed up like after the fuse box. it's possible that you could have a, a rodent or whatever that that you know did something like that and messed up multiple wires but caleb's question was good and if you guys aren't following what he's asking is is what do we have to chase after the fuse box if it's not the fuse box and it, the the short answer i think i'm i'm answering your question caleb is the short answer to that is it could be all, any of them. It could be all of them. And um, I don't think it is. Let me pull this up so I'm being clear. I do not think that it's going to be a wire that's downstream of this fuse box because it would have to be occurring in all four of these wires that, I've, that I have highlighted right now. It is the G2 and G3 pins, not connector. It, X1, it's right there, I, I, I missed it. It's right there, it shows me. X1 connector, the G2 and G3 pins, there would be two pins in there of that X1 connector. And Caleb, I don't think it's a wiring problem downstream. I don't, it, it, it could be, but for us to have a wiring problem downstream, it would have to be all four wires that are affected the same way. And it just doesn't really happen like that. We could have a rodent that chewed something and one wire shorted to ground and, and now it's not shorting to ground, but that's why the fuse was changed. And then now that wire is green and corroded. That's kind of what I was leaning toward before. But now after really digging into this and seeing all four of those wires go from the injector, no other connectors, from the injectors on bank one, that's injectors one, three, five, and seven, and they go right to this fuse box. This, this is almost has to be a fuse box problem. And, and of course that's based on the codes. And I did prove when I popped that fuse out, 
Even though this wire splits and goes to my ignition coils, the ignition coils don't code the same way. Unfortunately, we may have fixed it just by unplugging the fuse and plugging the fuse back in too. That fuse was changed. Why? We don't know. But that's concerning. Is it? it is concerning. <laughs> or this is something that this guy's been chasing for a while and somebody put a fuse in there. Why did they put a fuse in there? I, I don't know. I don't have that information. I'm hoping by the time we get back that my brother's back and, and then we can do a little bit more investigative work by, you know, getting some customer history type thing. So we'll see. We are in South Park, the actual park. So enjoy some scenery as we drive this van that's not breaking. I think at this point, what we do is we advise the customer that um, if this problem, you know, give him his car back, really. We give him his car back and we tell him when this acts up again on him to smack on his fuse box, to literally grab his fuse box and pull on the wires that are on it and then tell us the result of that. As far as, you know, diagnostic fees go and where we are, and even though Caleb and I are, you know, probably on two hours on this, um, just trying to recreate it because we're just trying to make a good video for you guys um, this is still a single in my opinion this is a single diagnostic charge because there was no communication with the customer other than the initial so this is you know this is not our two of charging uh, especially because we're just driving around right now and we went to go get food uh, if we were the technicians in the shop it'd be a little different we drive, go get food, and, and come back straight to the shop, and you'd be done. You call the customer and go from there, see what the customer says. Um, this is a work van, too, so that's a factor as well. But, you know, one like this, it's difficult. Do you sell more diagnostic time or not? Because you might not want to. Because, really, what are you going to do at this point? Other than, other than drive the van, what are you going to do at this point? Um, you know, many times you'd, you'd take cars like this and you'd let the technician drive it to and from work. But no question, the technician should get paid. No question, the garage should get paid for this job, even though we don't know the specific area of the fault. We only know some of it. We know what it's not. So we can tell the customer, give the customer a list of what it is not and advise him, look out, little squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to make some vibrations, man. I know that's super annoying. This cop coming our way is going to be like, what are you doing? <clears throat> we got nothing here, man. Nothing at all. Looks like my brother's back, so that's good. Um, let's go talk to him. And... Uh, I'm gonna stop this recording, Caleb, because I got nothing else to show. I'm on the injector one circuit. Here's the thing. So with research, all four injector wires go to the fuse box with no other connector. So I don't see a reason to investigate the harness between the fuse yeah. box and the injectors yeah. any further than what I already did. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, I pulled the fuse to prove that the ignition coils won't set codes okay. because they're on that same circuit that. and they don't. Okay. I pull the fuse, immediate four injector codes. Okay. And then I had a, a random misfire code that popped up too. Yeah. Um, so absolutely losing power on that one fuse would do this yeah. and not set coil codes. Gotcha. Number three, that okay. fuse was replaced. For I the, ah, damn it. I thought we were onto something. No, I'm I, like, I'm like, maybe no. someone blown fuse I, I did it just uh, because i'm okay. like it's on this circuit you right. know and i said i'll just put another 20 amp in or whatever it was and i liked your thoughts because the corroded fuse whatever yeah i wiggled it pulled I know, and i and, can see the pin drag marks on the old one too like it's it was making good contact and then okay yeah so then there's like a relay too and but there's all these other circuits but we would have 
if it was that relay dropping out, it wouldn't just be one bank, it'd be yeah. both banks. Yeah. And the engine would be shutting down on him. That's yeah. not his complaint. No. His complaint is intermittent mis he is saying it's misfiring yeah. really bad, it's right? Like engine let it fly. He's yeah. hearing pop and popping through the well, car. Of course he would throttle body. Yeah, and, of course you know, he would be. Yeah. And it's set in system lean codes and it's set in well see originally it was only set in random misfire and system lean codes. And when I looked at the misfires, it was only on the one bank. It wasn't set in injector codes? No. The first two times it was here, and I was like... That makes me think it's not going to be a power feed problem to the injectors. But the last time I saw... I, two times now. I cleared okay. it and it came back. Well, I went under global mode 10 data so I get permanent codes. Yeah. That was the only place I could see them. There, there were, you know, because you cleared them, I guess. So there was no codes when I started. There wasn't? No. Everything was cleared. I think at this point, what we tell him is when this acts up again while it's running bad, have him go underneath and pull on the fuse box and see if the misfires go away. That's what that's what we need him to do for us. And see if there's like a solder joint or something. Just inside. if he grabs that fuse box and it stops misfiring, then we're gonna put a fuse box in this yeah. thing. You know? Yeah, how do you prove that? You know, without well, it's so, it apart. You know, and yeah. it's so intermittent that, yeah. you know, that's just what we're gonna do. I I just feel like what well, or we're gonna go in that direction. Like yeah. Uh, just have him drive it, tell him, you know, the variables where we are. And I've had this conversation with him a but at least times already. This time, and though, he, he told needs me, to take it home, he, do what you need to do. And I'm like, oh, man. This is one where you want to take care of this customer. He's, he's a nice he's guy. A nice, yep, and he's already put money into, the, into it trying to fix it. And every Some time of it, I give him a bill, he's like tips me like 50 bucks. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. he, he, money's not an object, but I'm not a, you know, I'm not trying to. I want to fix it for him, but yeah. it's like, what do you do? And I don't know. We did. I did my best, Tanner. This would be one on what, how to handle a car like this. You know, as far as the viewers go, I was telling them how we charge in a case like this. Um, I, you know, we're, we took it to lunch and did that, so we're not charging yeah. the customer for lunch driving. No. Um, but it's an hour. It's still an hour diagnostic time, and yeah. and you know, you advise them where where you are, what you found. And then you go from there and then... To me, it sounds like he don't want it back till it's fixed. So I have a feeling I'm so driving a pimp we were white just, van for a little bit. We were just <laughs> talking about that too. I was like, sometimes you need to drive these things home with you back yeah. and forth. So I'm going to leave Dan or these test leads. And and what I want some pictures, man. If you see it, at least get me some snapshots. Okay. Okay? Yeah. And I'll leave you the probe that's under there. And uh, yeah. This is the way it goes sometime. This is troubleshooting. You take the good with the bad. Hope you guys learned something and hopefully there'll be an update. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Gotta let people know you're coming. Oh, I got low voltage. I got low voltage. I got eight volts. I got eight volts right now. It was the green man. Either my ground came loose or, or this is our problem right here. Low voltage, I'm, I'm like seven volts right now. Yeah. Oh, it's even less. It's dropping even more. Six volts. That's awesome. Okay, sweet. Oh, it just jumped <laughs> as soon as I put it in park. Whoa, that's weird. Drive, it's low. Oh. oh! Just a coincidence. It just jumped back up. Well, I saw it. I saw it.